Oh, maybe no, maybe yes, maybe no. But I think we left. Yeah, no, no, <laughs> bro. Very small in this surprising slide. Now that's this. <coughs> this is Debbie, as you can see from the headline. And um, this started about, say, 15 years ago, where my wife and I, Esther, um, were entering the High Sierras in the western part of the United States, which is Windows. And uh, we were constantly frustrated by roads that we couldn't enter and things that were blocked for us and so we decided to completely head the other way and eventually we found our way into the um, Californian and Nevada deserts. This is probably the northern tip of uh, Death Valley National Park and um, it's a beautiful area, it's very hot in the summer and it's extremely cold in the winter and in short it's a beautiful piece of nature. And I don't care if all these people stay in I share us and use their window system as long as we can use our Debian system. We are happy and we are in the wild and we can do all these nice things that Debian has to offer us. So what am I going to tell you in particular? Here are the topics that I had in mind. A little bit about the context. I'm going to tell you a little bit about that uh, strange name, University of Groningen in the Netherlands. And don't try to pronounce it unless you are a fluent Dutch or Hebrew speaker. Um, and in there, there was at some point in the university a call for a alternative working place. That is an alternative computer working place where people could use, could do their the computer things. And that became eventually the Linux working place. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. But there's much more than in the University of Groningen than um, the Linux working place. Um, I and my group have been using Linux from the very, very early 90s. So that was even before version 1.0 came out. And we switched to Debian, I think, in its first year of existence. I'm going to talk about that in detail. Uh, there's more Debian at the University more or less because of the switch that we made and I'm going to give you an overview of the kind of Debian products that you may encounter there as well. A uh, somewhat extensive example will be Stealth, which is a um, file integrity scanner that was designed about um, five or six years ago. Then I have some conclusions and maybe questions. So first of all, um, as we learned from Andy Stark, um, open is in. There's a smurgus word of open things. If you look at the web, there are all kinds of open things. And one of the things that I have heard about since Andy Stock was open government, but I'll add that to my smurgus word as well. Um, interesting is that in Europe, all these various governments, and over here, this is my pointing device, over here, you see the Dutch parliament buildings. Um, 
there is a, a law was passed that requires official organizations to start using open source products. And um, now that, that's a bill. And before it is actually effectuated, you're probably um, tens of years farther, but at least that bill was uh, passed. Uh, and he talked about Munich, uh, the, the country of Denmark, this year decided that their official product must be, their official documents must be written in um, the open document format. So that is a great step. And once you see that at all these levels, um, people and then governments are accepting open sources as their uh, favorite standards, then you see that the supranatural natural thing, the European Union, and here we have the Parliament building for the European Union in Brussels, that the European Union as a supranational organization also enforces that bill and requires that the member countries start promoting open source. So we are at a perfect moment in time to promote open source products in all lower levels because we can say governments require that. If you would like to have an overview at worldwide use of open source products, then I would like to refer you to the Center of Strategic and International Studies, which is located in Washington. And my paper that will be um, in the proceedings of this conference gives you the reference, but I'm sure you can find that on the web. Uh, it gives an extensive list of all kinds of um, open source products as they are required or used uh, in the world. You may have used that list, actually. I don't know if you did. Are you aware of that? No. No, but it, it's a nice, nice list. I looked at that list. It's, it's great. So, um, the context. A little bit national and supranational stuff. Then if we look at the university, um, the University of Groningen is the but one oldest university in the Netherlands. It was founded 1614, only some uh, 49 years after its first university was founded, Leiden, in 1575. And the University of Groningen has about 25,000 students and our staff consists of about 5,000 people. That's not only scientific staff, that's also support staff and things like that, but there are also, there are, so there are all in like 30,000 people working at the University of Prime. Well, students, well, yeah, they work. Um, since several years, the university's information uh, of technology center is responsible for running all its IT facilities. And what we see here is the main building. It has a remarkable architecture. The main building of the Center of Information Technology. What I like about this picture is the fact that it shows this window up here, behind which is my office. So <laughs> it, I got this from the web, and it, I think it's a great, great picture. It gives you an idea in what kind of location we are. As you know, the Netherlands is full of water, and so we are in a little pond, because they thought there wasn't enough water in the Netherlands. The University of Groningen um, is well known for its high performance computing work, and one of the main projects that we run is the LOFAR project, which is a project on astronomy, uh, which is uh, the equivalent of the largest radio telescope in the world, which has a diameter of, I think, uh, 200 miles. Now, you cannot build a structure like that. So what I did, I did some really ingenious things with all kinds of measuring points spread out over an area with a diameter of 200 miles, and that effectively acts as a big uh, dish in which you can collect all these astronomy data. All those data run into our computer center, is uh, cleaned up there, is washed, is filtered, and that's one of the things that we do. Um, we see here some pictures of these big halls, and in there, apart from the supercomputers that are used for the low 
by all kinds of servers um, for the email, for the university library, for basically everything that you would like to have at the university to keep it running. And most of these systems are running on um, Unix kind of operating system. There are some window systems in there, but I would rather not talk about them. <laughs> um, at some point, if you look at this, this is the server area, if I may give it that name. Uh, but people at their desks and the students, they are using very simple computers. And for a long time, it has been uh, MS Windows that has been the working place which became a standard working place in the early 90s. And I think that's a very bad idea, but on the other hand, at that time you really couldn't give the university students and staff members a Unix-like system. Either it was commercially much too expensive, or it wasn't ready to be spread out over the whole university. Um, initially we used Slackware, but that required you to recompile every package from scratch at that time, and that was a non-option for the normal user. So Slackware was not an option. And so our traditional working place, and I like this horrible picture about uh, the Windows business with all these drools drooping down and things like that. Um, it's of course horrible. It is not open, you have no idea what's going on behind the scenes except for that it's bad, it is expensive, it takes a fair amount of the uh, budget for the IT facilities for the university, it's monopolistic, that's, that's, that's a bad I will go back to that. And it is constantly in need of repairs. Now I don't say that our open source products do not need repairs and don't have bugs, but this is symptomatic, it is symptomatically wrong and you can more or less prove that it cannot be better than it is. Fortunately, at some point, there were open source alternatives for almost everything people were using at their normal desktops. So why don't you use open source products? Especially if the political climate at that moment is uh, favorable towards open source. There are more problems with the traditional working place. One of the things is that if everybody is using Windows, well that basically holds true for everything that you use as a monoculture. If more than 50% of your systems is that particular system, then you're running the risk of a monoculture and thereby of all kinds of diseases. Let's see, how many of you running Linux, Debian Linux, run a virus scanner on your computer? Okay, there are two, yeah. How many of you run also Windows system occasionally? Well, I do sometimes, unfortunately, with a virus scanner, right? So that is exactly the reason why a monoculture is so dangerous. It is the only system that is run by a large number of computers in your organization and the attacker only needs to find one vulnerability in that system and the whole range of your computers is gone. The malware tends to target the dominant, in this case, Windows system. And because that system is so complex, you cannot get it right. So there are plenty of reasons for using open source alternatives. I have a nice example in about 2007. At once, one particular day, over 200 computers of our university were infected by a group of hackers and became victimized to that hackers group. I don't think you could do that even if they were all running Debian because there are so many variants of that Debian system. <coughs> I mean, there is a basic operating system below there, but what everybody is using in their computers is basically varying from installation to installation. So, it was time to start realizing the Linux workplace. And indeed, it was clear 
by the time we started working on that, that it should be a Linux uh, working place because um, the Linux working place, I mean, we had a stable system, we have all this software in place, and so why don't you use that system as an alternative? There are very good reasons for doing that. Um, the choice now is what kind of system? Should we use Red Hat? Should we use Slackware? Should we use SUSE? Um, in fact, there were two competitors, and that was Ubuntu and Debian. To me, there's not so much difference. I prefer Debian. I run Debian since, what did I say, the early 90s or something like that, right? And um, it seems that Ubuntu is somewhat more familiar to the common user, but if you're more into the computer system itself, if you're more interested in what's going on behind the scenes, then Debian might be your system of choice. And if you go to the core uh, system administrators of our university, and here we have one fine example of a system administrator at the University of Pontiac. And his words, when I took this picture, were, you can't find anything on GUI Ubuntu. Now, I don't want to offend my wife, who is in the back of the room there, but this morning she had problem connecting to the university's here wireless internet, and me, too, couldn't find something on GUI Windows. So I think he may be right when he focuses on GUI character of Ubuntu. Fortunately, for the distribution of the system, it's not so much a problem. The Linux working place looks like this. Um, if you have difficulty reading this diagram, I can completely understand that, and that's not the point. The point is not that you cannot read this diagram because I'm going to dissect this diagram in a few minutes. So this is the whole picture. This is what Jürgen Bokma, and his picture is over here. Jürgen Bokma is one of my colleagues, and he run the uh, Linux Working Place project. Uh, now his name is, Faith, is a famous name in the Netherlands, Bokma, because Bokma is the manufacturer of a particular kind of booze in the Netherlands called Geneva. And since there is no wine being grown in the Netherlands, I thought it might be a nice idea to bring to the cheese party a bottle of Bokma. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, when I passed yesterday through customs, the security officer looked at my bag and said, what's in there? And he looked in there, and I found my bottle of vodka, which I bought at a, a liquor store. And he said, that's not sealed. So you cannot take that into your plane to the United States. So I had no other option than to remove the vodka bottle, give it to the customs official, and say, I hope you like it. <laughs> there will be no vodka at the cheese party. But I took some Dutch cheese, so I hope you like that. So let's go back to this. Um, Back to business, there is this working place. And the unattended install goes from some plain computers using all kinds of mirrors to a computer that can be in principle booted. It's not yet ready to do that. And if your original computer was a Windows system, it comes out of the um, initial uh, unattended install as a dual boot. Now, interesting here is that we use our own Ubuntu mirror and we have an own package um, repository, and those repositories are called Debian repositories. And for this, I had the help of the Debian developer George Danchev who helped us creating those uh, packages. George is from Bulgaria, and we invited him over to the university for a workshop for about a week, where he trained us to create packages, how to create these repositories, so we could do all these kinds of things ourselves from then on. 
now we are here. We have computers that will become the Linux workplace, either pure or dual boot. Then in the second part, we are going to create images. Uh, we use a no Novell product for that, and it creates images. An image for each of these different forms, the dual boot form or the single Linux workplace. Then from that, we clone computers that will eventually be installed in the um, several departments and that run specific scripts. The university has a class B network and that's subdivided on all kinds of smaller networks and these smaller networks um, have their own IP addresses, ranges of IP addresses, have their own system administrators, have all these little kinds of specific things that um, must be fine-tuned, must be tweaked for that particular situation. That happens in the first boot period, and from there you have a running either dual boot or a running Linux workplace. And that is an eventual working place for either a student working place or it is a working place for a staff member depends on where the person is working. And then if you look at what you have, then you have something that is not a standalone system as such. Well, this computer talks with all these kinds of supporting systems around it. That's why there are all these arrows running towards these installed computers. For example, the basic system administrative work software is installed in these computers. The, the user's home directories, uh, they tend to be roaming and that means that if you log in into this computer you have your home directory. If you log into that home computer you have your home directory as well. So all the home directories and user's own unpackaged software will be available there as well. Then authentication takes place using uh, the uh, LDAP, actually, that's, that's a spelling error, that's uh, the LDAP system. But what we do for authentication is we immediately copy the root uh, credentials uh, in its hash form into the uh, working place computer, so just in case this one goes down, you can still log in here. Then we have remote services and remote administration that we use all these kinds of products for. And the fact that it says you know well iPrint doesn't mean that it has to be Nobel, but that's what uh, uh, Jurgen made when he created this picture for me. Then there is a service desk that can talk with the users here and give them help if they are run into problems. Uh, there are all kinds of statistics being uh, collected and being used. You can immediately see if a computer is being used, where it is located, who is using that computer, and if you are, for example, a student and you would like to find a working place, you call the help desk and say, I would like to have a Linux workplace, and where do I find the nearest? And then the help desk employees say, where are you located right now? Well, I'm here. Okay, if you go there into that room, there's that computer, and it's available for you. Very helpful. So, that's the system. Now, how flexible it is. So, we have a Linux working place and it's being created. How flexible? It is not complete. It cannot be complete. You have like 30,000 people, and all these people have their specific wishes and things like that. But we think that the Linux workplace will be asymptotically complete, in the sense that once somebody asks for a particular package, whether it exists or not, it will be added to our standard Linux working place. So tomorrow's Linux standard is a superset of today's standard. And to quote Larry Wall, the good thing about standards is that there are so many of them. 
And indeed, we have to borrow another standard than we have today. Every added package, every new package will be added to that system. That's very good. How do you do that? Well, there are basically three ways to do that. You can, as an ordinary user, say, I have this program, and it's great. I would like to have that into the standard Linux working place. Now, there are two routes. The formal route is to file a request with the service desk, and then eventually it wind up, winds up in the Linux working place. But it is much faster and much smarter to go to Urian and say, hey, Urian, uh, you are running a project. Could you help me out and do that program into the LVP? Uh, yeah, fine, good, let's do it. And it will be there in an hour or so. If you are a more experienced user, you can have pseudo root access. That means you get the right to run a script <coughs> from your computer on that controls the organization of the software in the repositories and makes sure that that requested package becomes embedded in the Linux working place. And then there are these kind of super <coughs> users that um, are so trusted that they can be given direct access to the root partitions of these uh, uh, mirrors and uh, repositories. That's good. If you're in that, then you can fuck up and you can change all the things around. But you are trusted and of course you don't do that. Very nice. So that's it. Is that all? No, that is not all. I already mentioned George Dunchev and this picture of this little squirrel I found on his Facebook site. Uh, we've seen George earlier in an earlier slide, so we now have a problem. We don't know if he looks like the one in the earlier slide, or if this is the one he looks like. The other one here is Tony Mansill, and we can verify his picture because he's sitting over there in the room. There he is. And both George and Tony have been extremely helpful and willing to support me in uh, creating the Debian packages that I have been creating over time. And I'll give a short overview and some somewhat more extensive overviews of those packages. To teach programming languages, one of the languages that we teach is the uh, C++ language. And for that, since the early 90s already, we use a document that has been enlarged and grows over the years, which is called the C++ annotation, which is now a Debian uh, package as well. Uh, at the end of that programming course, my students learn how to create their own grammars. And for that, I created a C++ parser generator, much like Bison, but now specifically uh, aiming at the creation of C++ uh, source files. I've been writing various tools. Inkmate, which is a make utility. XD, which is actually a very nice little tool. It's an abbreviation for X plus more directory change. And you can do something like XD ULB, and then XD will change directory for you to, for example, use your local bin. Very nice, very addictive, and I don't think I could survive if I cannot <coughs> use XD anymore. And there is Yodel and Stealth. Now, Yodel is what I do in the Alps, but it's also something else, and I have two somewhat extensive examples of these products, Yodel and Stealth. Yodel. Yodel is a meta pre document language. Um, it can be used to write all kinds of documents in a very simple way, and I've given you an example of how to create a manual page using Yodel. And one of the things that you see here, that all the uh, meta characters that you use in a meta language, they're only parentheses. But it's a special meta character in the sense that if it is not used as a meta character, it's just a parenthesis. So that's nice. You don't have to do special escape things and that kind of thing. And if you do something like that, you just write what you would like to do in plain text and then eventually you get something like, for example, HTML, or you get LaTeX, 
or you get uh, plain text, or you get a uh, GRAW file. This one, if you use it to create a manual page, you get a GRAW file, and it comes out like that. It's a perfect manual page, and all the manual pages that you will see in the Debian products that I've been creating, they're all made using Yodel, and it's, it's a jiffy. It, it's absolutely nothing to do with. We do it for big documents as well, but I'll spare you the illustration. You should read the manual page. Now, you know, if you look at the Linux working place, try to extend that. Try to extend what's going on there to the whole universe. Then you will agree with me that there are many, many systems that must be in a pristine stage. The software in there must be okay. Hackers, the bad guys, will try to intrude at some point in those systems and we try to chase them away, but at some point they will succeed. What are hackers doing when they are into your system? They change things. No matter what way you look at it, they will change things. So the idea that we at some point had was, why don't you have a program that verifies the integrity of your essential software. And that's what Stealth is doing. Um, normally, what you do, you have all these kinds of standard things, right? Uh, so frequent uploads, you check your logs, um, you do a default deny, all these standard security things. No worse comes to worse and the hacker really enters your computer. How do you trap the hacker if your log files don't tell you that something has happened, if he comes through the default deny policy, if you have upgraded to your latest software, what do you do? You run stealth. The SSH-based trust enforcement required through a locally trusted home. Now I want you to look closely at that extension of the word stealth. And you will probably understand that it took me quite some time to find this meaning for the word stealth. And yes, it did. Um, it is an open source file integrity check. And the core idea, fortunately, is not mine. So I can proclaim it here um, in all absence of any modesty. What you do is you create a fingerprint of the current state. Now many integrity checkers do that, mind you, so that's nothing new. But that's what you do. You detect modifications of the fingerprint. Many integrity checkers do that. And then you separate, and this is new, the state info from the target computers that are being checked. So your fingerprints and the handling of the comparisons are not taking place on the computers that are being checked for their integrity. So this is the setup. We have a stealth monitor, we have SSH connections, we have several client computers that may be connected to the internet, and that's it. Several. I wrote two here, but that may also be 200 or 2000. Very good. We only need one stealth monitor. And also, we would like to have this system as separated as possible from the internet. There shouldn't be any incoming connection into that computer, only outgoing connections. So that's it. So what do we do then? The fingerprints that we get from the software here is maintained on this computer. And there are no specific things on these computers that hint to the fact that stealth is being used to check the integrity of the software of these client machines. Now, a client machine could be a server computer, and it could be a user computer, it could be a Linux working based computer, it could be a repository. The stealth monitor computer itself is inaccessible. If you want to access that computer, you have to go to its console and log in as a user, and then you have access. But there's no way to access that computer from a distant location. 
interesting thing is that, again, different from existing uh, file integrity checkers, that nothing is pre-specified by stealth that adds to its stealthy characteristics. <coughs> if you would like to use this kind of software to verify the integrity or inspect or generate the statistics, you do that. If you would like to use that software, that's fine. You could use find, you could use MD5 sum or SHA-256 sum, all these kinds of software that are available, you could use those software to um, verify what the actual state is on your client computers. Now, in order to do that, it is clear that if you are using on the client computers programs like find or these hash sum computer software, that that software must of course be in a possible stage as well. So that we can do as well. We can check locally whether the state of that software that's used there is still intact. So we can inspect vital software locally. And finally, normally you would do a stealth run or something that you would like to do every once in a while using a Chrome job, but even that could be a hook that is used by the attacker to see whether something is going on. If always at a certain moment in time find is running or the hash is computed of files, then the hacker might start to think, isn't there something weird going on? So we can change this in such a way that the stealth runs themselves are not predictable. They may start at any moment in time. You can say to stealth, do for example, um, for example, in the first 20 minutes of every hour do a check. Or do a check once every hour. It is up to you to decide when to do that. You have complete freedom to specify when you would, in what interval, you would like to do these integrity checks. And it's easy to configure that. So let me give an example. Here is what you do to check the integrity of the system's send UID files. You have some arguments that you would like to specify with the find command um, where you say I'm, I'm interested in the SUID U and group flags for the user root or the group root and those arguments are being added to the find command where this one is replaced by what I wrote here and for that you run the SHA-1 sum program and that one is being run for all the SUID files on your target computer and the logs are being sent using a secure connection to the stealth monitor. And what you can get is these kinds of reports. For example, the hacker added a file. He added a file, user bin root perm. I didn't do that. There is no package called Urzer bin root perm, and suddenly it appeared. Who has done that? Let's investigate. This is its hash. It wasn't there to begin with, and not only that, the bastard also removed sbin unix check password. He removed that one. Um, why did he do that? I don't care, but he did it, and we have to take measures to prevent him using it. And of course, this is a nice one. He modified the login program into a cooked version of his own. All this information you get automatically and it's very hard for a hacker to detect it. We've been using stealth now for several years in all our important um, systems and it runs as a chart. Perfect. So that's it. As as age-based trust enforcement and then somebody hacked through the screen, <laughs> acquired through a locally trusted. This is a locally trusted host, of course, because you have to trust this computer to do all these funny things on your client computers. 
connections are SSH based and it is trust enforcement. So that's the system, and that's how it got its name. That's a Debian product. It's been there for, now I don't know how long, long. It's one of the first things I think that we added to the list of projects. Yeah. So, conclusions. There's a worldwide interest right now, and I can say worldwide because we know that because of that Washington organization. There's a worldwide interest in open source products. You can use that to convince your managers or decision makers that they really should, I don't say switch to, but at least consider changing to open source projects. And if you use monocultural operating systems, as we've seen, for example, from that hack that we had, thank you, um, monocultural operating systems are inherently dangerous. It's not only the case in software, it is also the case in agriculture, um, and in intensive farming and all kinds of things. Last year, we had in the Netherlands, we had a case of the Q fever with goats, and that resulted in the killing of, I think, 20 or 30,000 goats, where more than half of them had no fever at all. And that's called preventive cleaning up. I think that's preventive killing, and I have some other strong feelings about that that I'm not going to share here because I might um, offend people, but in private I could say the, the University of Groningen by now has an alternative, not to killing goats, but to using a working place. That's the Linux working place. And the nice thing about that is that it is an alternative. We are not enforcing people into using Linux. No, we are offering them a choice. We are offering them a choice. You can be continuing using that bastard system that you've been using over years, but you'll have much more fun if you at least considered switching to something else. Like what we did like 15 years ago when we decided not to go into the high Sierras, but into the desert. Debian packages. It is of such good quality, people. You have an idea how good it is because you're all Debian folks. Jurgen told me that he has been working for five years intensively creating that limit work thing, upgrade or upgrade. And over those five years, he didn't have a single problem with dependencies, with software that didn't work, with things that broke when you upgraded to a new version of Debian. It works perfectly. There's no other system that does it so well. And actually, that was the main reason why the university decided to start using Debian as its main system rather than, for example, a system like Red Hat. So, we covered the things that I intended to do. Why should we use open source? I told you a bit about the reasons why we wanted to switch to, open, to a Linux working place. I told you a bit how that is organized. You now know what kind of products we are running. I gave you some examples and some conclusions, and there's only one thing left for me to do, and that is to thank you for your attention. That's it. <laughs> there are room for some questions. Do we have a microphone in case someone... Thank you. Hello, Jeff. Thanks. <coughs> Thanks for the, the talk and description. I'm curious about, um, you sort of described the deployment scenarios. I'm curious if you could describe a little bit about the, uh, the maintenance approaches. For instance, if you have to use any configuration management tools, um, for once the machines have been deployed, how do, you keep, how do you keep them up to date? Is it just a rewipe process and reinstall? Or? I, I think you do that the way, I'm not sure, because um, you're actually all over asking me. Um, but I think from what I understand from what 
Jurgen told me is that they do what you always do. Uh, that is, um, you do an app uh, update and an app upgrade every once in a while and make sure that you have the recent software. And if upstream in our own repositories change something, then that software is being redeployed. And from, um, we have the, let me see if I can go back to those slides. No, there's the unattended install, and then you have the next slide. Remember where the installation takes place. There's also something where you can, um, at the third slide, I think uh, that was visible, where you do remote system administration and system maintenance. That is the situation where the administrator is able to draw from the repositories and spread the new software over the distributed uh, uh, Linux working places. Is that an answer to your question? Yep, I think so. Okay. You should. Uh, there, there will be a puppet Birds of a Feather session coming up um, later in the conference that I think uh, you might be interested in just to be worth, worth talking about. Puppet is a configuration management system yeah. for, for and a I, I, uh, I know that uh, we are using several non debian tools right now. Um, uh, Jurgen also told me that he had some problems finding the right tools in the Debian uh, standard software, but um, things change, and maybe right now there are appropriate tools. Uh, for example, one of the things that is going to be changed is that um, we are using SIFs right now to mount the user on directories, and that will be change shortly into NFS uh, version 4. So things like that change. Um, we tried to do SIFs for user home directories at the University of Connecticut. Um, yeah. We tried to do SIFs for user home directories at the University of Connecticut. We had trouble with the window managers. Um, they create some sort of block files or some special files that yeah. SIFs didn't support. Yeah. Uh, did you have that problem? And if so, how did you work around it? I don't think so because you're talking about Linux. We're talking about Linux. Right, Linux creates, like GNOME and KDE, yeah. create some special files in the home directories. Okay. And SIFs doesn't support that. Okay, so it may be that uh, Jurgen told me that he had several problems with indeed SIFs. He, did, he didn't explicitly go into what kind of problems that was. There was simply no time to do everything there. And um, he said, but I don't care. I'm not going to solve that right now. Um, we are trying to get a way around it. Maybe I can give you your address and you could sure. contact him anyway. Um, and he said, I don't care because we are going to switch to NFS uh, level for short yeah, shortly anyway, so why invest money into a dead bird or something else? Yeah? Does that more or less answer your question? Yes. If you would like to have your address come to me and I'll give you after Thank you. Session. Okay. I think the line is actually not working. Yeah. Oh, it's also not feeding in Oh, okay. <laughs> so this is sort of pointless. But yeah, that's a, that's, <laughs> that, that, that is no problem. Um, you run into that with OpenFS as well. Uh, you, I, I recommend looking at AFS before you decide for sure to do NFS before. Um, there are features both ways, but AFS is also open source project, also in Debian. Um, worth taking a look at. It's a little idiosyncratic um, in some respects, but it gives you management capabilities that NFS doesn't have. Uh, but yeah, it's a known problem um, with file systems that don't really like uh, special devices. I'm pretty sure there's a way to change it in the known configuration to use a different directory to store that stuff, and then you just stick that somewhere on local disk to store just those session sockets and leave the rest of the stuff out of the user home directory. Okay, thank you. I think there was another question over there. I'm, I'm just wondering, in the university setting, I, I, I haven't seen anyone build, uh, training Debian developers. Uh, do you have any plans for well, we had, we had George coming over uh, to train us using the package constructions and things like that. And uh, most of our, of our core system administrators prefer Debian anyway, so they are pretty well versed in using Debian. Um, and then, well, you know how it goes. There's a new guy coming in and he's learning from the existing people. 
and then he can do it as well. And he can read also, most Dutch people can read. And, and so they read the manual and uh, they can do things that the other guys could do also. I'm, I'm, I'm kidding you slightly, but you know what I mean. Uh, it, it, it's not that much of a problem. Does that answer your question? You're welcome to visit us. I mean, <laughs> come to us and talk to Jurgen in person and see what he did. Or also, I can give you his address and you can contact him. And I'm sure he's happy to um, write back to you. Okay? Class. Like, why don't we rest the moment where we should break up and uh, people who want to go to another talk can 